Uh, this talk is about uh, class files and compilation and that sort of thing. Uh, my name is Gary Fredericks. I live in Chicago. I work at DRW. I'm on the internet and whatnot. I've been using Clojure for a while. Uh, so the goal in this talk is to um, understand the relationship between Clojure's bytecode and the dynamic runtime. Um, uh, I think this is uh, useful for me just because I like to know how things work. Um, if that's not a good enough reason for you, um, then it might also be useful for debugging. Uh, you might understand stack traces better, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, this is not a straightforward topic. It was kind of like really sprawling and complicated and I had trouble isolating it down to something that was makes sense in 40 minutes. Um, part of the reason for that is Clojure has a lot of entry points for compiling or loading code. Um, there, it has this in-memory representation of like namespaces and vars that it deals with a lot of the same things, but it's, it's also very different. Um, those, those two have to work together. Um, and there's also not a clear line between compile and runtime um, because you can have things like macros or just top level side effects. And so uh, you can always be running your code at compile time. It just makes a lot of this stuff harder to, uh, harder to think about. Um, so this talk has a lot of things missing. There's stuff I'm just not talking about. Um, some things I'm gonna say are false because sometimes falsehoods are easier to understand than the truth. Um, and then there's things I didn't even know that I left out, um, so I apologize for that. There's just a lot of stuff to figure out. Um, and I was doing it because I didn't, uh, I didn't understand it myself, even after using Clojure for nine years or so. Um, so this is the, the order we're gonna go in. Uh, I'm gonna take a single code example and then look at it uh, five times from different angles, um, and we'll learn different things along the way. Um, so to start with, we're going to require some code and talk about what that does. Uh, so this is the code we have. Uh, there's, there's two files, a couple namespaces. Uh, the first one requires the other one and it defines a function that uses a value from the other namespace. So I think if you've used Clojure at all, hopefully this is not very intimidating code. Um, so we're gonna try to figure out what happens when we require this. So to do that, we start a REPL. But to talk about what happens, I really have to be able to talk about uh, the dynamic runtime, and that's something that I, I'm not sure is very broadly understood, so I'm gonna try to introduce it real fast. Um, and if you're not interested in the rest of this talk, but still here for some reason, uh, this part I think is a lot more applicable than anything else and can go a long way toward understanding what's going on in a lot of different contexts and closure. Um, so I'm gonna call this the namespace graph, and I'll be referring back to that a lot. Uh, so a namespace enclosure is an instance of a Java class called uh, closure.lang.namespace. Um, and that class has a static map in it, which is essentially a directory of all the namespaces that have, are currently loaded. Um, so when you start a REPL, there are 18 namespaces that are loaded. Um, one of them is closure core. Uh, so there's, this is a map from symbols to namespaces. And in this context, the symbol is, uh, is just something, it's a, it's a name. It's, you could think of it as a string if you're not familiar with how symbols are used here, and a string would not be far off. Um, but we, we have a, um, the, an entry in the map from the closure core symbol to uh, the closure core namespace. So it's an instance of the namespace and that map is mutable. Um, and then the namespace itself has two mutable maps in it. One called mappings, one called aliases. Uh, so the, the aliases map is the easiest one to explain. That's a map uh, from symbols to other namespaces. This is what's used when you require something and you say as something else. So you just wanna have a prefix for some other namespace that you can use locally. Closure Core does this for the closure.java.io namespace and it, the prefix is JIO. So you could imagine an arrow going from here to the Clojure Java IO namespace. I'm just not showing it because I don't have room. Um, the, the mappings map is a little more complicated. Uh, it's also a map from symbols to other things but they're for two or three different purposes. Uh, one is for classes you import. So if, uh, whether it's something you explicitly imported or the Java Lang classes that are imported by default, you will have say a map from the string symbol to the string class. Um, and then you'll also have mappings for all the vars in the namespace. And so whatever the different purpose, this, this map serves to say, if you see this symbol in this namespace, this is what it means. Either it refers to a, a class or to a var. Uh, so for, uh, for functions in closure core, like require and the sock, you will have a mapping from the require symbol to the require var. Um, a var is another place of mutability. So we have three levels of mutability here. There's the, the registry map of all namespaces. There's the two spots in a namespace where we have mutable maps from symbols to other things. And then the vars themselves are also mutable. A var points to something like a value or to a function. 
Um, so sometimes it's hard to keep track. If you have a def in, um, like def in require in closure core, there's, there's three levels here where require is mentioned. There's the symbol, there's the var, uh, and then there's the function. So the function's the thing you call, the, the var is a sort of like the place that registers that there is a name require in closure core, and then the symbol doesn't mean anything on its own. It's just used in this map. Um, so we'll come back to this uh, soon, but we were at the REPL trying to require some code. Um, so we were passing the symbol to require representing our namespace. Um, so require is going to open up the file and start loading forms one by one and evaling them. So the first form we encounter is this ns form. Uh, the, an ns form is not really a special thing in Clojure. ns is just a macro that does some side effects. So to talk about what this is doing, uh, we need to macro expand it. So this is the macro expansion of that ns form. Uh, this has three sections. We'll go through them one by one. Um, the first is a call to in ns. This is just a basic function call to a, a function in Clojure core passing a symbol. Um, and what it does is, is pretty easy to understand also. It will create the namespace if it doesn't exist and then set a dynamic var that, ref that says what namespace we're compiling in. Um, so creating that namespace means that we're mutating this namespace graph. So in particular, we're adding an entry to the namespaces directory on the left. So the my ns symbol is now going to map to this new namespace object we created. Um, and by default, it's going to start with uh, 96 mappings to Java Lang classes. Uh, so I showed one, uh, which is string. The string symbol maps to the same string class that uh, string maps to in Clojure Core. Um, so this is just what you start out with. Uh, we then have this block of uh, code uh, called with loading context. This is a macro I won't talk about much, um, but it's just going to run the, the lines below it. Um, so the first thing we do is this refer call, refer Clojure Core. Um, this is saying that I want to have all the vars, the public vars from Clojure Core in my namespace uh, as something I can refer to without any prefix. Um, so what that means in terms of the namespace graph is we're adding more symbols to the mappings map in my NS. So we went from having 96 or so entries, now we have 756, um, and they're pointing to all of the public functions in Clojure Core. I, I showed the, the one for a sock, there's also one to require that I didn't show, and then there's a whole bunch of others for Clojure Core vars that are not fitting on the screen. Um, and so this is the, the normal state of a namespace um, after calling the NS. But um, in this particular case, we also have this require call. Uh, so the, the require clause in an NS form does not do anything special declarative. It just turns into this uh, function call to the require function. So we're passing it this data that describes what we want to require. In this case, it's our other namespace, and we also say that we want to prefix it. Uh, so we're now we're calling require again. Well, this all started by calling require. Now we're calling require with something else. So we're going to load that file and start reading in those forms one by one and evaling them. So we start with the NS form. This is a different NS form, but it largely expands to the same thing, except we, we no longer have that require call and not now all the, the names refer to uh, the other namespace. But um, we're going to do the same thing again. Uh, we'll do NNS, we'll do refer closure core, and so now we'll end up with uh, a second namespace that again has all those same mappings. I'm not drawing them because the, the screen would get too noisy, but um, it's still pointing to string, require, a sock, and all of the other classes and closure core of ours. Um, so now we have two name, namespaces set up. Uh, there's this other section um, in the NS macro expansion which does this trivial check whether two different symbols are equal and they're never equal, so uh, it goes to the else branch and does this do sync that just uh, updates a ref and says this namespace has been loaded. So if somebody tries to require it again, it'll be a no-op. That's just some bookkeeping I, I, I won't talk much about anymore. Um, after, uh, after evaluating that NS call, we have the def foo foo line. So when you evaluate a, a def like this, it's going to create a var if it doesn't exist. So in this case, uh, it doesn't exist, so we do create it. Uh, so var called foo in the other ns, uh, it has a, a pointer back to the namespace it was created in, so you can tell that it is part of that namespace. Um, and then after creating the var, we're going to set its value to the string foo. So hopefully that's pretty straightforward. Um, we've now finished loading the other namespace, and we had called require, that's why we were doing it. Um, but there's one thing we haven't done yet, which is take care of the as other part. So require, once that file's done loading, it's going to call a uh, closure core function called alias, 
which is just going to update the, uh, the aliases part of my ns to say that the other prefix now points to this other namespace. Um, so that's that, we've, we've finished the, the ns form um, and now we're gonna compile the asac foo form. Uh, so a def in is very similar to a def, it's just that the value is a function instead of something else. Uh, so we're going to, again, create a var. This time in, the, in our first namespace, it's called a sac foo, it has a pointer back to the namespace. Uh, and then we set its value to be a function. And that function itself has pointers to the vars that it uses. Uh, in this case, a sac and foo. Uh, so that's how it uses the asac function at runtime is through the var, and it gets the value of foo, again, through the var. Um, so that, that's my first part, this is just loading code and, and what, is, what happens when you load code. Um, the big takeaway here is that we have this namespace graph that has this structure, we can update it, it's mutable at three different levels. Um, and when we're loading code, a big part of what's happening is that the top level forms are uh, having side effects, largely just updating that namespace graph. Okay, uh, that didn't mention bytecode at all. So uh, let's go back and figure out where the bytecode was in that. Uh, I, I don't think I said yet, but um, Clojure is a compiled language. It compiles to bytecode almost all the time, whether or not you're actually saving that bytecode to files. Um, so that's what we'll be getting into right here. Um, so again, we're starting with a REPL and we wanna require our code. Um, so now I need to talk about uh, all the different entry points for loading code in Clojure. Uh, so this is a, a very gnarly graph that, or diagram I made just by looking at all the places where you could um, ask Clojure to load or uh, compile code. Um, so there's, there's a few larger boxes here. The stuff that's free floating outside of the boxes are all Clojure core functions. So these are entry points that you can call. On the left there's eval and load reader and load string and load file. And in the top right, there's load and require and use. Uh, the, the three large boxes uh, on the bottom are implementation. Uh, there's private functions in Clojure Core on the right. There's the Clojure Lang RT class, which is written in Java. RT stands for either runtime or retweet. Um, <laughs> the, so this is a Java class. A compiler on the, on the left is also a Java class. They're both very big. They have a lot more than five methods, but I'm just showing the part that I think is relevant here. Um, and then on the top, we have three other entry points. In the top left, Clojure main is a popular way of launching Clojure processes. Uh, if you use gen class to make uh, a main method, that goes through a different code path. And then on the top right, there's a, uh, a class called compile that I didn't know existed until a month ago, and I've never seen anybody used, but I put it here, and now I'm not gonna talk about it anymore. <laughs> um, Okay, so we're at a REPL, we started a REPL, uh, and we called require. So being at a REPL and running code, it means going through this part of the call graph. So we're starting in main because we used the Clojure CLI tool to start a REPL, and that uh, launches via Clojure.main. Once main, the main function figures out that, it, that you wanna run a REPL, it will call the REPL function, and REPL stands for read eval print loop, um, and it is literally just calling eval in a loop. Uh, the closure core eval function, the same one you can call yourself. An eval does nothing more than call a method called compiler.eval. So we're all the way at the bottom of this call graph. Um, calling compiler eval, uh, it means that it's going to macro expand the code, it's gonna analyze it, um, and it will likely uh, compile it to bytecode and load it into memory. Um, so uh, I guess I should say first that, that most of the time eval is gonna take the, the form, like require my ns, whatever it is, and then wrap it in a zero arg function and compile that to a class and call it. Um, so, so I'm gonna talk for a minute about what a function looks like when it gets compiled in Clojure. So every function literal in Clojure is compiled to a separate bespoke class that does the stuff in the function. Um, and they, they largely have this shape, so th this is the uh, outline for the class that does require my ns when you enter that at the REPL. Uh, so the, the class is called user dollar eval one. It extends a, a closure base class for functions called closure dot lang dot a function. Uh, it has some static fields called const zero and const one. Uh, const zero is a var that's to hold the closure core require var, and const one is a symbol, although the type there is a fun, just to confuse you. Um, the, the static section of this class, and uh, you may not know this on the JVM, every class can have a, a static section of code that just runs as the class is being loaded without there being any instance of it. 
Um, the static section just uh, sets those two static variables. So for const zero, it looks up the closure core require var via the RT class. It's just passing the strings in. That's going to return a var. Uh, and then const one, it's just using the symbol class to get the symbol for my.ns. So those two things get initialized as the class is loaded. Um, if you want to call a function that's been compiled like this, you need to instantiate it. There's a, uh, a constructor you can call it, just call super. Um, so instantiating it allows you to then call the invoke function. So a function enclosure is something that implements the ifun interface. The ifun interface has an invoke method on line 15. So this thing has an invoke method. Um, in this case, it just proxies to invoke static above. Uh, the, the closure compiler will produce a static method if it can. Uh, so the work is being done in invoke static. It's just all on line 12. Uh, when you call this function, what happens is it takes const zero, which is a var, closure core require var. It calls git raw root to pull out the function inside the var, which is an ifun that we can call invoke on, and it calls invoke, and it passes it const one, which is the symbol my ns. So all this boilerplate is just to express the idea of calling require with the symbol my ns. Um, so every, uh, every closure function gets compiled this way. Top level things like at the REPL often get compiled this way. Um, the only thing missing here from a, just a like, general useful description of closure functions is that if, uh, if a function is a closure itself, meaning it references local things that are around it, um, then that will get compiled into instance variables that get passed to the constructor. So you would just see when you construct it, you pass these things in um, and then it saves those. Um, when, we, when we look up the var in the initialization section of this class, we are going back to this namespace graph and we're looking things up by name. So we use the closure core string, uh, we look that up in the, the namespace registry to find the namespace, and then we use the require string to look up the require entry in the mappings map, and we find the require var. Um, so that's, that's all that's happening here, it's, it's a runtime thing, um, so this stuff has to exist in order for us to, to use the code. Um, when, uh, when you're at the REPL and uh, running things, I, I said it's being compiled to classes, um, but you can't use a class on the JVM without loading it somehow, and this is what class loaders are for. So in Clojure, we have this class called Dynamic Class Loader um, that uh, I don't understand this too well, but as best I can figure out, uh, this thing gets instantiated for in a lot of places, and principally, every time you uh, evaluate a top-level form, it's making a new class loader just to load that one form. Um, but they all st share this static uh, class cache, which is a, a map from strings to classes. Um, and I, I think what this structure enables you to do is have uh, multiple classes with the same name. So if you want to redefine something, you have uh, the same name but now a new class. And so having different class loaders lets that happen. But sharing the same cache means that they can all see everybody else's classes. Um, but I'm not going to say much more about that. I, I'm not even sure that any of that was true. Um, <laughs> Okay, so we were at the REPL, we, uh, we tried to call require my ns, which entailed um, compiling this, this function to a byte array and loading it into the class loader to get a class object and instantiating that and calling invoke on it, which then called the require function in the require var, which sets us up for this code path. We're now actually trying to require some of our code. Um, so this starts in the top right with the closure core require function. It goes through all of the the private functions in Closure Core, this is a lot of just like argument handling. Uh, it also decides whether to actually load the namespace or just skip it because it's already been loaded. Uh, and then comes back out to the public load function in the top center. Uh, this has some strange arguments. Um, I, I haven't seen people use this function directly almost ever. Um, but it does cyclic dependency checking and then calls into RT. There's a load method, and this is where we start looking for actual classes on the class path. We look for a CLJ class, we look for a CLJC class, we look for a dot class file with certain names, um, and decide what to do with them. So if we decide to load from source, uh, we're then gonna check if the compile files var is set to true, and it's not normally, so in that case we go to uh, the load resource script method and then finally down into the compiler. So the compiler has this load method, and an eval method. Load is gonna take this reader and just read all the forms in one by one and call eval on them. This is the same eval that we called from the REPL. Um, and so for each of these top level things, we're gonna probably be making a, a function and compiling that and loading it into memory and then invoking it. Um, and so to figure out what's happening, we, we need to think about what are these things doing as 
as top level side effects. We went through that earlier, but now we can think about it in terms of bytecode. Um, so NS, the, the NS form there in particular, uh, we macro expanded it earlier. I'm gonna macro expand it even more. We had a uh, with loading context call that was on line four. Uh, I macro expanded that. Um, and there was a uh, do sync on line 16. It was also a macro. Um, so this, the, the whole do form is going to get spread out and evaled one by one. So there'll be a, a function that uh, wraps line three and gets compiled and invoked. And then a function for uh, the second section. But the, the thing I wanted to mention is that there's now, now that we've macro expanded, there's two function literals that are visible. There's one on line four and there's one on line 17. And every function literal will get compiled into its own class. So this whole thing is gonna get compiled into five classes. There's one for line three, there's a couple for the middle section, and then there's two more for the last section. So I just wanna talk real quick about what it means when we have multiple functions in a single expression. So we'll just focus on the bottom part, starting from line 13. Um, this code here is, uh, is a little verbose, but it, it only really does two things. It checks if two symbols are equal, and we know they're not. So we'll go down to line 16 and uh, call this run in transaction method on the locking transaction class, and it's just gonna pass it a function. So we check if two symbols are equal, and then we pass a function to a Java method. Um, so we, we're, the eval is going to be making a class, uh, a function that expresses this logic. Um, so let's look a little bit more detail what that looks like. So there's gonna be, again, a class that, in, that extends a function, it has an invoke static method with no arguments, and it's doing a symbol check it's on line five, we check if one symbol equals another, it doesn't, um, and so we're gonna call a uh, run in transaction and we need to pass it a function. But passing a function from this level um, means we need an instance of that other class. So the, the function literal in that code got compiled to a different class and we need to instantiate it. So we just do that in line here. On line seven, we, we use new, uh, we call the constructor uh, for this other class with uh, with no arguments, and then just pass the, the instance to run in transactions. So this is generally how things like higher order functions work in Clojure. Um, so we're, we're, <coughs> we're uh, requiring uh, our two files. That means uh, the, each top level thing is going to get turned into a function and um, compiled and loaded and invoked. Uh, and then as we invoke them, we're gonna be having these, these side effects in the namespace graph. So the same things we went over earlier, adding namespaces, adding aliases, adding mappings, creating vars, setting values on vars. We just go through all these things and do all of that. Um, so that is the same thing, but with bytecode. Um, summarizing, each, each function literal is compiled to a dedicated class, and if you instantiate that class, you get a function. Uh, both at the REPL and during normal code loading, you are compiling to bytecode with a, a zero argument function for each top level thing, uh, loading it into the dynamic class loader, instantiating it and invoking it, and probably it will be having these top level side effects on the namespace graph or maybe returning a value to the REPL. Um, so now that we've gone through all that, we can talk about ahead of time compilation. This is where I was particularly confused about how things work, because we have this, all this dynamic stuff that we're talking about, and yet somehow we're gonna write it into class files and load it into some other JVM. Um, so ahead of time compilation, this is, uh, refers specifically to writing class files the way normal Java people do. Um, and we're going to, uh, this is a feature that Clojure's had for a while. Uh, a, a lot of people avoid it. I think it had a lot of bugs in the past, like differences from normal Clojure usage. I don't even know the current state of things. I was just interested in how it works. Uh, and in any case, you can't really avoid it because Clojure Core is compiled AOT, so the jar file just ships with a bunch of classes in it, uh, class files. Uh, so I think it's still useful to understand. The entry point for AOT is a function in Clojure Core called compile. You just pass it a namespace uh, as a symbol, and it should try to compile it. If you do this at the REPL, uh, you'll get this error uh, says no such file or directory. Um, somehow you can figure out that the directory it can't find is the classes directory. Uh, the Clojure core has a var for called compile path, which is defaults to classes. This is just the directory that it's gonna write classes to, um, but it needs to exist first. So we need to make it and try starting up the REPL again. Um, and we call compile and it's going to return the, the same symbol we passed. And we check the classes directory, uh, we're gonna see a whole bunch of class files related to spec. If we filter that out, uh, there'll be seven left, 
uh, that are related to R code. Um, there's four for one namespace and three for the other. Uh, so first let's talk about what did calling compile do. So this is a different entry point in the top right. And the first thing compile does is it binds the compile files var to true and then sidesteps a lot of the code that require went through because it doesn't support the same arguments. It just supports passing a symbol for the namespace. Um, and so it goes to load one at the bottom, back up to load, goes through a lot of the same things until it encounters the, the test right in the middle for whether compile files is set. And this time it is set to true. Um, so we go through this alternate code path uh, down into the compiler where we're going through a pair of functions that are very similar to the load and eval functions or methods that we went through the first time. Um, we still have this higher level one that takes a reader and loops through all of the forms and it calls compile one with each form. Compile one is gonna be macro expanding and analyzing and it's gonna be evaluating the code but also writing any class files that are associated with that form. So it's actually writing to the file system at that point. We're doing that as we go um, but still having all the same side effects on the current JVM in the namespace graph. And then the higher level method, compile, that's looping over all of these things, it's gonna be collecting the top level side effects that happen and then writing them all to a single initialization class file at the end. So you may have seen uh, in error messages or something like that that, there, that sometimes Clojure looks for classes with the name underscore underscore init. Uh, so we can see these on line six and nine. We, when we compiled uh, our code, there were two namespaces and now we have an init class for each one. We also have some other classes lying around. Uh, if you remember the ns form after it got macro expanded, it had those two function literals inside of it and each one of those gets compiled to classes. So we have uh, two for each namespace, that's uh, lines four, five, and seven, and eight. Um, and then we also have our function asak foo. So that got compiled to a class as well on line three. Um, so, so I said that the, uh, the init class is responsible for uh, doing all of the side effects that loading the file performed. Uh, it's not a function itself and actually the only thing the class is for is for loading a single time and it does a whole bunch of work in its static initialization and then gets discarded. Uh, so let's think about what, what are the top level things we need to do when loading the my ns namespace. Uh, there were the things from the ns form itself. We needed to call in ns with a symbol. Um, that second section was all in a helper function, so we need to instantiate and call that. Um, that and that calls require and goes into the, the other namespace. Um, and then we need to do the, the transaction locking thing and pass the other helper function to that. And then there's the, the side effects associated with the defin. So we need to uh, make sure the var exists for a sock foo. We need to instantiate the class to get an actual function. And we can set the metadata on the var and set its value to be the, the function that we instantiated from the class. Um, so all this stuff gets done in the my.nsinit class. And so this is a, a lower level outline of what that's doing. This class has some static fields just like function classes do. There's two vars. Uh, there's the nns var that we need to call. There's the sakfu var that we need to set up. And then there's three constants we're gonna use. There's the, the metadata map that we'll set on the var and then two symbols. So the, the static initialization section is factored into two pieces. There's the init zero method that uh, just sets up all five static fields. So it's gonna look up the two vars and then it's gonna call whatever classes it needs to to set up the constants. And then the load method, uh, which does all of the top level side effects. So it's gonna do the ns things, it's gonna call in ns, it's gonna initialize that other helper function and invoke it, it's gonna check if the two symbols are equal and of course they're not, and then it's gonna call the run in transaction and initialize the other helper class and pass it to that. And then it's gonna set up the var. So set the metadata, initialize the function class and set the root binding. So everything I said in the previous slide, but this time I said it again. Um, okay, so if we look at this from a different angle, when we were compiling, uh, what are the things that happen in what order? We call compile with this name, the, with the symbol for my ns. That's gonna go through that whole call graph down to compiler.compile, which is the, the higher level function in the compiler. And then it's gonna loop over the forms and call compile one for each one. So on line three, we call compile one with the ns form. So as it's compiling that, it's gonna write the two helper classes to the file system, but then also load them into, into the class loader. Um, and in the, in the course of invoking one of them for side effects, it's gonna call require uh, for the other ns. So then we go back through, again, into the compiler, call compile one with the ns form from the other thing, which writes another two helper classes, and we call compile one with the def foo, 
which has that effect like in our JVM on that namespace graph. We're going to actually create the var and set the value. Um, but that action will get recorded by the init, the, the init class. Um, and the, so the side effects from those two steps will get written to the init class for my other ns. And then we'll finally exit out of require. Um, and we'll do compile one for the next form. For def in asoc foo, it's going to write the asoc foo class to the file system. Um, and then finally, it's going to collect those side effects from the first namespace and write those into its init class. So that's how we end up with the, the seven class files in the JVM. Um, in summary, compile uh, is a function that uh, works at the namespace level. You can call it with a namespace symbol. Um, all of the code that you're compiling gets evaluated into the current JVM, so it's, it's setting up all of the structure associated with that code in memory. Uh, but at the same time, it's also writing class files for all of the functions that it encounters and other things and includes an init class file for every uh, file you're compiling. Okay, so if you have all this stuff on the file system, can you require it again? Hopefully so. Uh, you can start up a REPL. Uh, you might have to add the classes directory to the class path. I'm not really sure what comes by default. Uh, but you can call require with a symbol and that's going to go through this class path here or class path, it's going to go through this call path. Um, so it's very similar to normal require until we get to the middle and where it's handling the CLJ and class files and it decides, well, we do have a new enough class file so we can use that instead of going to the compiler. Um, so this, this goes into a branch that just calls class for name. So th this is just the JVM's way of loading a, a class uh, from a file or from the class path. Uh, so we give it the name of, of the init class for this namespace, the my.ns underscore underscore init, that's the name of the class. And just by loading the class, because all the work is in the static initialization section, all of this stuff is gonna happen. It's gonna set up the, the vars and the constants, it's, so it's actually um, mutating the, the namespace graph, creating namespaces, creating vars. It'll call in and s. It, that will, uh, the next it'll end up calling require on the other namespace, and that will go through the same call path uh, back to the middle where it's going to use class for name on the other init class and then do all of the same work um, and set up the vars and initialize the functions, etc. So it's just reproducing all of the same in-memory structure that was there when we were compiling. Um, so it's kind of brief, but uh, hopefully enough. Uh, so you re require namespace. Um, when there's a class file available, it will load the uh, init class for that namespace uh, just by loading it triggers all of those top level side effects that sets up everything you need. It does all the same things as when you normally load the file. Um, and then that class is discarded, doesn't have any use anymore. Uh, what about reloading things? Um, we can think about uh, maybe in a process after we've loaded these static class files in, uh, what, what happens if we redefine something? So redefining something can mean uh, doing something at the REPL. So if we require myNS, we just load all these static class files into the JVM. We can switch the REPL to my other NS, which is the place we had def foo foo, and then we can type def foo bar. Um, and so this is going through the, the eval path that we talked about earlier, and when you eval def foo, it's going to look up a var, uh, and the var already exists, so it doesn't need to create it this time, and sets its value to be the, the string bar. Uh, so it's mutating the, the namespace graph, and uh, even though all of this stuff was set up by loading class files, it was done in a, in a dynamic side effecting kind of way, and so doing more dynamic side effecting stuff is totally compatible with that. Uh, the asoc foo function um, has a pointer to the, the, the foo var, which is now pointing to something else, and so it's going to see the new value of foo. So we can call it, uh, and we'll get the, a map with bar in it. Uh, you can also reload things by calling require with the reload flag. So for example, if we edited the, uh, the file here, uh, we could add um, another key value pair on line eight. Uh, so if we do that and we call uh, require with reload, this is gonna go through actually the same call path that you go through when you first require something. Uh, what's different is that the test um, in the middle of the private section where it would normally say, well, the namespace already exists, I don't need to load it, it's gonna see the, the reload flag is there, and so continue loading it as, as it normally does. Uh, and then it gets down to the compiler, and it's gonna start evaling each of the forms one by one. Um, 
and that means uh, doing all of the side effects. And so we can think about what, what are the side effects that happen as you eval this code, considering that we've already loaded the code from class files. Uh, we're, we're going through, uh, we're calling NNS, uh, which creates the namespace if it doesn't exist, but this time it does exist, so it doesn't do anything for that part. And it's also gonna set the current namespace, which is good for the rest of the eval we're doing. Um, then it's gonna come to this require call and try to require the other namespace, but that already exists, so that's a no-op and that's fine. Um, we're going to compile the asakfu function and load it into the dynamic class loader. It'll have the same name as the, the class from the file system, um, but that's fine. The dynamic class loader will let us shadow the, the previous class. So anytime we look up this class now, we'll see the new one. Um, the compiler will look for the asakfu var in the namespace graph. It already exists, so it'll find it. Doesn't need to create anything new. It's gonna set the metadata, which is fine. Um, and then bind the root to a new instance of the function that it just created and loaded, uh, which means that our, the existing var is now pointing to a new function that does the new thing, which is good. And if we now call this from the REPL or anywhere else, uh, we're gonna get the new behavior. Um, so uh, when you're reloading code, whether it's the REPL or requiring, uh, they, they do basically the same thing. You're just evaling more stuff and it's having more side effects on the same namespace graph. And since the, the static code that's loaded via AOT is all about side effects on the namespace graph, these things go together pretty well uh, and, and largely do what you would expect. Uh, so this is mostly what I have. There's a, a lot of like special cases that I didn't talk about. Um, and hopefully, I, I think you can get pretty far without worrying about them. I'll mention just a couple. Uh, difference, a difference between AOT and uh, loading things the, the usual way. Uh, you can see differences if you have like two things with the same name, whether it's two functions or two def types that have the same name. This is just because the JVM can tolerate two classes in memory that have the same name, but a file system can't. So you can get different behavior, but you know this is not really a normal way of using closure. Um, also, uh, it's often said that you uh, that the the REPL has the same semantics as loading code normally, which is mostly true. But there are things like the compiler flags, the dynamic vars for things like unchecked math and whatnot that have this this natural file scope uh, that's set up by the compiler, but eval can't do that for you because it can't tell where classes begin and end. So if you are just like pasting all of your files into the REPL, you can get different behavior if you're using those kind of vars, but I don't think that's a normal use case. It's just something to, to be aware of. Um, so this is kind of difficult to summarize. Uh, there's a lot of stuff, but uh, some big things there was, uh, we talked about the namespace graph and how uh, lots of top level things in Clojure are just mutations on that namespace graph. Um, functions get compiled to special classes. They can, you can do that in memory via the dynamic class loader. You can write them to the file system and load them later. Um, AOT just involves writing all the, the classes you would normally create to files. Um, and then for each top level file that you compile, uh, you create an init class uh, that performs all of the top level mutations, but uh, in its static initialization section, and then you can load that uh, in a different JVM. Um, so that's, that's really all I have. Uh, I hope it made a little bit of sense. I'd be happy to uh, spend the whole rest of the conference in the hallway talking about this more if you'd like, uh, but thank you everybody. <laughs>